Hey, I'm starting a brand new series called uh, No Limits. Going to be a good, somebody go woohoo. Woo there you go. I'm going to start a new series called No Limits. And, uh, you know, there are no limits in the name of Jesus. All things are possible. The Word of God tells us all things are possible. So we're going to dive into this for the next four weeks, and we're going to be looking at the subject of no limits. I mean, when you as a kid loved superheroes. Did any of you ever think you were a superhero? I'm going to tell my age just a little bit. But when I was a kid, I loved underdog. <laughs> Anybody remember? Do I have underdog on the screen? Do we have underdog? He was a simple shoeshine boy, or I guess I should say a shoeshine dog. And just lived a simple, ordinary life until he heard a cry for help. He would get into a phone booth and he would come out underdog. He would go from this ordinary shoeshine boy to this superhero that could take care of things. And I loved underdog. But more than that, I loved the fact of someone going from ordinary to extraordinary. So we're going to look at the whole process of having no limits in the name of Jesus. There was a man in the Bible. There was a lot of them, but there was one I'm going to talk about. And his name was Jabez. And Jabez was an ordinary guy, really doing an ordinary thing. But he prayed an extraordinary prayer. He prayed a bold prayer. He prayed a strong prayer. He prayed a prayer that on the surface, it seems very selfish. But when you begin to dive in and look at everything that was entailed, he prays an incredible prayer of blessing. And this is what it says in 1 Chronicles, and this is not on the screen, but in 1 Chronicles 10.4, he said, I don't think it is, but he says this, Oh, that thou would bless me indeed. Now that's a simple prayer. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. But when you begin to understand the prayer that Jabez prayed, Jabez prayed a prayer that God, I don't want you to bless me, that it is just all selfish and it's all about me. But God, I want such a blessing that your blessing enlarges my tent. It enlarges my borders. It enlarges my territory. It enlarges the influence that I have with people. Oh, that you would bless me mainly so I can be a blessing to other people. Jabez prayed an incredibly bold prayer and God answered his prayer. We all want to be blessed, don't we? Everybody wants to be blessed. Everybody wants the favor of God. But sometimes we don't want to work for it. We just want to receive it. I don't want to work for a billion dollars. I just want to scratch off something on a piece of paper and win it. <laughs> know what I mean? But how many of you feel like that every morning you get up and you've got a bullseye on your back. You get up, and it's a great day. You had a great weekend at church, and boom! You feel like the enemy has got you targeted. You feel like the enemy is prowling up behind you, and you feel like the enemy has got you zeroed in on his scopes, and you've got a target on your back. Well, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news to you today, but not only do you have a target on your back, but guess what? <laughs> He's coming in all directions. I have found that we also have a target on the front of us, and it doesn't matter what, what comes at us. The enemy is constantly coming at a bullseye that he has placed on us because we all know that he comes to do what? He comes to kill, steal, and to destroy and so we're going to look at this today about the enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy, about this bullseye that's on our back, and to understand the principle that God wants us to bless us, God wants favor to fall upon us, and there's no limit to what we can achieve in the name of Jesus Christ. I love movies. Anybody, any moviegoers in the house used to love a movie? I love a good movie. You know what I really like? I love those comeback movies. 
Rocky Balboa, Adrian, I love you. But I love the Rocky Balboa movies where he comes in and he's nothing more than just a street fighter. He gets in the ring and he's really just getting the snot beat out of him. And before it all comes around, he gets his head in the game. He gets his, physically, he gets in the game. And he goes from underdog to superhero. And I'm sitting on the end of the couch. Yes, go Rocky, go Rocky, go Rocky. And my wife's going, great day in the morning. (laughs) Yeah, no, I just, how many of you like the blind side? The story of Michael Orr. Man, he was homeless living on the streets. And that lady that played Sandra, Sandra Bullock played her part. She sees him. She pulls him in. She blesses him with favor. She blesses him to move into the house. And the next thing you know, he is making good grades. He's on the team. He played in the Super Bowl last week. It is an incredible story of going from homeless to triumph, going from just ordinary nothing to extraordinary. And I love these, these, these stories. Wednesday night, in my class over here on Wednesday nights, we are studying about Joseph. He went from the pit to praise. It's a story of how he literally went from being the apple of his dad's eye, having favor on his life, going to a pit where they wanted to kill him, finding himself in prison, to go to a palace only to find himself in prison again, then moving on and getting elevated to the place of the second in charge of all of Egypt. Only God does that. I love the comeback stories. I love the stories that people tell of when they succeed. But how many of you, whenever you get up in the mornings, you might feel like this guy right here facing an opponent. (laughs) He's ready to go. He's ready to get after it. But there's a lot of times in my life that I'll wake up in the morning and something will hit me, something will blindside me. There is a target on my back that the enemy hits and all of a sudden I look at this situation and in the natural, in the physical, I look and I go, this thing is bigger than I am. This thing's bigger than I am. But whenever we see the reverse side of this, of how big our God is, when the things of this world become very small, the things of God become very large in our life. So we want God to be large and in charge of our life. How many wants a blessing? How many wants favor? Hey, if I did something in this place today as your pastor, would you just trust me? Did your eyes have to get that big? (laughs) How many of you would just trust me? How many would look into your purse or your billfold and you would pull out an amount of money that you could just say today, I don't need it. I will gladly just get rid of it. I don't need it. I want to bless. I want to bless somebody with something. And so I'm going to ask you just just open your billfold, pull it out, and I'm going to come and just pick up what you don't want. Now, you'll trust me, right? You don't want it. It's okay. You're going to sow this into the ministry. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it is. Hey, do y'all two want to go down the aisles and just pick it up for me? Uh, I'm just going to take, I'm going to take what you have that you might look at as an excess today, and you're going to sow this into ministry, and today you might not get this back. But this is what I think. I think that God has called us to be in the blessing business. And to be in the blessing business, we have to learn how to be a blessing. Agree or disagree with that? And so what we have been teaching in our church is that we're a generous church. We're generous in, in what we give to the church. We're generous in what the church gives out. We want to be generous in everything because in everything that we do, we want to show the love of God in an incredible way. Amen? So, you got that? Come on up here. I ain't done yet. yet. Oh, man. (laughs) Just do a little jig and a little dance. I ain't done yet. Also, is this is why I believe and just keep going? Blessing. Now, there we go. There we go. 
But we do. We want to be a blessing. We want to be a generous people, and we want to be a generous church, and we want to be able to help if we can help out. But, but again, like I say, when we get up in the mornings, a lot of time we got change in there. Right here, we'll drop the change on the stage if we need to. Okay. When we get up in the mornings, a lot of times what we find is there's an enemy that doesn't want us to be blessed. There's an enemy that's going to come into our lives to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And how many of you know that at any given time, hey, that's, that's good, isn't it? This is excess money. This is just excess change. Good lands. This is, this is a blessing. But how many of you know that enemy is going to use any situation? He's going to use any circumstance. He's going to use anything he can at any time to destroy your hope. He'll use any situation to steal your joy. He wants to diminish the peace that passes all understanding in your life that worry may come into your life. And when the seed of worry comes into our life and it is beginning to be, it is beginning to be, be fertilized by negative thoughts and, and, you know, I've been beat up. I've got a target on my back. There's an enemy that's real. Hey, you know this, anytime that happens, the enemy that is real is nothing compared to the God that is alive. Is that not the most incredible thing? I have no clue what we have here. No clue at all. But this is what I do know. There's a family in our church that I feel like they've been attacked. And they have come to us and uh, they are nothing but family to us. I can't even tell you how much I love this family. But it was a God thing that brought them here. It was a God thing that accidentally Bernardo got to go to C3 with us to the conference. And whenever Bernardo went to the conference, yeah, he, he never in his life has he done anything like this. But he was able to go to the conference. And, and while we were at the conference, God blessed his socks off. We're driving home from the conference. I mean, everything is incredible. He's going to run a job for his brother out at the mall. He goes to the mall. And while he runs in to look at a job, some ding-dong steals all of his tools out of the back of his truck. That's his living. That's how he takes care of his kids. That's how he takes care of his wife. That's how he puts food on his table. And if he don't have his tools, he don't work. Bernardo, I have no clue what we have in here. None at all. I don't know how much this is, but I want this to be a start for you. Okay? Can you, uh, I want you to pass that right around. I want that to be a start for you because this is what I know. God didn't bring you here for an enemy to beat the hound out of you. God brought you here to understand the love of God through the love of people who love God, who love you. You're, uh, you're a family member. When you cry, we cry. When you rejoice, we rejoice. And we want to be a blessing to you. Yes. Can we do that? But I don't know. I know you probably need something in your hands in the morning before you even get started. <laughs> you know, I didn't have the money to go buy some big, big, big tools, but I thought I can get you started a little bit and I can help you out. So this is just saying to an enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy, get your stinking hands off of my Bernardo because you have no business in this place. What the enemy stole was rusted, but what God is going to give you is brand new. There's a sermon in that. And so we want to bless you just a little bit today. But, you know, I kind of got to thinking that you might also need some screwdrivers. There might be something that you need to tighten up just a little bit. And the enemy came in and said, I'm going to steal your joy. I'm going to steal that old stuff out of the back of your truck. But God is saying, we ain't going to let the devil get by with that. What we're going to do is we're just going to bless Bernardo in such an incredible way. We want you to be able to get up and go to work and at least have some tools to start with before you ever go to the store. But this is what I know. Bernardo, you're going to get blessed coming in. And you're going to get blessed going out. You are the head and not the tail. You are the beginning in Jesus Christ and not the end in that junk that was stole out of your truck. And so I think what we ought to do is just go ahead and add to it today. 
you probably need a good socket set to kind of get some things going. And this is just a testimony of us saying to the devil, get your stinking hands off of our boy. Get it off of our boy. I have no idea what's going on, but people are handing money to me. Oh, and it's not a little bit of money. Come over here. Hey, as I lay this into your hand, can we pray for him just real quick? We can do church this way, can't we? Can we just pray for you? Come here. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray in the name of Jesus that this is a super blessing, okay? Father, you brought this family here for a reason. And the reason is so you can show them your faithfulness. And what the enemy comes in to try to steal, kill, and destroy... We will say no way in the name of Jesus. Our God is bigger than any thief. Our God is bigger than any enemy. Our God is bigger than any situation or any circumstance that may depress us. Our God is bigger, and he will prove himself faithful. I pray tomorrow morning as Bernardo gets up and goes to work that the favor of God will go before him, that blessings will fall on him, and that the love of Jesus will just come out of him and touch everybody he meets. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh, Lord, that you would bless me indeed. Mm, God, take me from something ordinary and give me something extraordinary. God, let me see an extraordinary grace, not an ordinary grace that this world throws out, but something that is extraordinary that has the name of Jesus written all over it. Let favor fall upon us. Let blessing fall upon us. Let what the enemy comes to destroy, let God breathe new life into it and make it extraordinary in the name of Jesus. Isn't that cool? Yeah. This is what I know. Sometimes in our life, Situations arise, things happen, and we feel like the underdog, don't we? We get a divorce in the family that we didn't expect, and we feel like a failure, and we feel like an underdog. We walk in, and all of a sudden, we lose our job and our finances, and we don't have what we need to bring home the bacon, and we feel like a failure, or we feel like an underdog. But this is what I know about underdogs. God takes great pleasure. And he takes great glory in elevating the underdogs of our life and making them extraordinary. I'm going to give you an example today, and, and I'm going to read some scripture here. I'm not going to read a lot of scripture today, but I'm going to read a little bit. And I want to start off just talking about David. The story of David in the Bible is, a, it is an absolutely incredible story. And when we look at the story of David, we truly see a great success story. We truly see someone that went from ordinary to extraordinary. We literally see someone that went from an underdog to really a superhero in his time. We see what is classified as an awesome before and after story. And when we meet David, he is just like the shoeshine boy underdog. He is on the back 40 out in the middle of nowhere, taking care of sheep with nobody being around. He's not up front. It's not an upfront ministry. It's not an upfront job. He's been out there, and he's completely unnoticed. He's all by himself. That job out there is what you would call nothing fancy. There's nothing glamorous about that job. He's literally sitting and watching a bunch of dumb, dirty sheep. That's his day, day in and day out. I would call that kind of ordinary. But there was a prophet, and his name was Samuel. And the prophet Samuel was sent by God to Jesse's house. It was the father of David to Jesse's house. And when he got to Jesse's house, God told him, here amongst all of these sons that's in this house, you will find the next king of Israel, and when you find him, I want you to anoint him. So Jesse, 
does what any good father would do is he grabs his kids and he grabs the best looking ones first. And he says, he says, come on up here. Because I want my son with the bulging biceps and the perfect hair. I want you to see my son who is going to be the next, nah, who is going to be the next king. This one's good looking. Samuel, you need to pay attention to this one. Oh, but you're not going to believe this second one that I got. He is like a moving brick house. Mighty, mighty, letting it all hang out. He is big. He is bad. He is something on a stick. He is like, Samuel, you need to check this guy out. You need, this one is the man. You need to, there is something with this one. Oh, but Samuel, you need to see my other boy. He is an athlete like none other. You need to see this guy play ball. You need to see this guy in action. Samuel, if you don't pick the good looking one, if you don't pick the beefy one, you need to pick this one. Because this man, he is absolutely incredible. He is not just a ball player. He is good looking. Know what I mean? And Samuel begins to line his sons up. And I think Samuel, as a dad, he's beginning to point out all the good qualities of every one of these kids. And he's going, oh, yeah, but this isn't all I've got. I've got one. Mm, you're not going to believe this. I've got one right here. He is the smartest of the bunch. When he gets, I'm going to tell you, when he gets in the crowd, all oh, these guys feel really stupid. And so Samuel, what you need to do is you need to look at the wisdom of this one. This guy is absolutely incredible. You know what I mean? You need to look. And so he begins to get all of his sons, and he lays, lines all of his sons up in front of Samuel. And Samuel begins to walk in front of the, the ones that, that dad is so proud of. The ones that dad goes, these guys are extraordinary. These guys are incredible. And he begins to line them all up. And as he walks through, he gets to the smart one. He goes, oh, wait a minute. It's not you. And Samuel comes to the next one, the athlete. He goes, oh, it's not you. I know, it's a shock. He gets to the good-looking one with the perfect hair. Can I touch that? I'm going to have that in heaven, I'm telling you. He comes to the good-looking one with the perfect hair. Samuel knows this is the one. This is look at him. He's perfect. No, you're not the one. Surely it's the beefy master. Surely it's it. Which way's the beach? That way. And Samuel comes up and he goes, No, it's not even this one. And Jesse is kind of at this place where he's going, but I don't get it. These guys are physically perfect. These guys are ripe for the picking. These guys, you would be a nut to have to not pick these guys. What is wrong with you? And Samuel looks at Jesse and he says, are these all of your sons? And Jesse has to think for a second and goes, oh, wait a minute. No, it's not all of my sons. He said, I've got a little boy that's on the back 40 taking care of some dumb, nasty sheep. And Samuel says, go get him. And he goes, wait a minute, go get him? You mean you want to look at the boy who's tending sheep over the perfect hair? You want to pick the boy tending sheep over the athlete, over the one that is a brainiac? You want to pick the one that is the beef mind? I mean, I mean he says, go Get the boy and bring him to me. He runs out and he gets David, who is just tending sheep on the back 40. And he brings him up. He brings him up 
and he places him in front of Saul, Samuel. Places him in front of Samuel. And I know that as Samuel is walking up to his baby boy, who is dirty, he's not cleaned up, he's been in the, in the sheep pen with sheep, he probably stanks just a little bit, he probably has oil all over his hands because that's what sheep are, they're massively oily under their wool, and he places David, who everyone looked at as ordinary, in front of Samuel, Samuel walks up, and the Word of God says this, and I believe I have it on the screen for you. The Word of God says this. Rise up and anoint him as king. I want you to raise up, and I want you to anoint him as king. Now, Samuel did an incredible thing, because when he anointed him, you know, we'll do prayer circles sometimes, and we'll take the little oil on the finger, and we'll go, in the name of Jesus, you're healed with the little oil. Nothing wrong with that. It's symbolic. But in biblical days, when they anointed with oil, it wasn't just a little bitty dot of oil. But he took a flask of oil. And over the top of David's head, I wanted to pour water on you so bad today. You don't know how bad I wanted to. But I'm not. He took a flask of oil. And as he raised that oil up and he began to anoint the head of of David, it said that the oil flowed down completely over his body, a sign of the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon his life. The sign of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that does what? It gives us the wisdom we need in tough times. It is the power of God working in us. And Samuel anoints him, and it is a physical anointing where he is literally saturated by the oil. And the Word of God says... That at that moment, the anointing of the Holy Spirit was upon his life. Give David a big hand. Samuel, listen to God. Samuel was able to look beyond the ordinary or the the, the physical appearance. And look at just an ordinary boy and see the hand of God that was upon his life. And so he anoints this little ordinary boy who is tending sheep. He anoints him and he says, you will be the next king of Israel. You will lead all of Israel. What would that do to somebody's head? What would that do? Would it give you the big head? Would it give you an air about yourself? If somebody told you and anointed you publicly in front of a bunch of people, anointed you and said, you will be the next king of Israel, would you go back to the sheep pen? I wouldn't want to. God uses ordinary people all the time to do extraordinary things. God uses ordinary people all the time to do extraordinary things. See, this is what I believe that God wants to do in our life. God wants to take you right where you are, the situation you're in, the circumstances that are all around you, and he wants to elevate your thinking. He wants to elevate your life. He wants to elevate your plan. He wants to elevate your purpose to a whole nother level of living in your life. He wants you to experience a whole nother level of living. And at that whole nother level of living, don't you know that there's a whole nother devil at that level that's got a target on your back that's coming after you? That's why it is so important that the anointing of the Holy Spirit is upon everything that we do. But how often do we look at the situations that we feel like God is calling us into and we say this, I don't think I can be used. I don't have that special talent, and I don't have that special ability. I can't hold a microphone, so how could God ever use me? I'm not ever going to stand in front of an audience and speak, so how could God ever use me? Well, you don't know where I came from, and you don't know what I did last night. How in the world can you stand there and tell me that God's got a plan and a purpose for my life? Let me tell you this. God takes great 
pleasure in taking the underdogs of this world and elevating them to do extraordinary, extraordinary things. Punch your neighbor and say, I'm ready for an elevation. That's it. I'm ready to go to a whole nother level of living. But what is beautiful about this story is this. Once David is anointed to be the king, he immediately starts walking in obedience towards his calling. What does David do? Right after he is anointed king, he does not walk in and, and knock Saul off the throne. He doesn't do it. He doesn't walk in and say, well, listen here, Saul, there is a new sheriff in town, and it's me, and I'm kicking you out. He doesn't do anything. What he does is he waits patiently upon God's timing, and he goes back to the sheep pen, and he takes care of of the business that is at hand. Now somebody, there, there should have been some good amens there. Because there is a great sermon in that all by itself. He goes back and he waits on God's timing. In fact, when we read the story, he goes back and he just sits in a field and he takes care of sheep. But how many of you know that sometimes God will use those ordinary things in our life to train us for the extraordinary things that he's got planned for us in the future. Yep. Amen? It was, it was several years back. I was working out at Pantex, and I had been working out there for several years. My wife and I, we have known that we were called into full-time ministry. And, you know, we want to put the cart before the horse for God. We want to help God out, don't we? Anybody besides just me and my wife? So we're always trying to kind of hurry God up, kind of help God out, and, and we're doing everything we can to do what God wants us to do. And I found myself for the next seven years, I knew that God had called me into full-time ministry. I knew that God had called me into something very special. But for the next seven years of my life, he placed me in a warehouse hauling tooling all around Pantex. And for seven years, I could not get out of that. For seven years, God would not let me out of that. For seven years, there was not a window one that opened up. For seven years, there was nothing at all that was taking place. And if you're like me, sometimes when we find ourselves in those pits, sometimes when we find ourselves in those situations, we cry out to God and we say, God, why aren't you doing anything? God, how come you're not moving? God, you're not moving fast enough for me. Let me show you what fast looks like. And when we study the life of David, we see a perfect picture of someone that I believe was so in tune with God that he said, you've anointed me? That's great. I will go back and do what I need to do. I know you will put the pieces together. I know you'll put everything in order, and I will wait on your timing. But how many of you know that, that we live by the clock, and we don't live by timing? See, God's timing is perfect. And what I look back now and I've discovered in my life was God put the right people in my path, the right people in that warehouse to begin to teach me what I needed to know. See, I didn't know I was going to learn to be a pastor from working in a tooling warehouse with people that God placed there. But when I got there, I'll just say it. I hope they're not, nobody's here from there, there today, but it was kind of a heathenistic atmosphere. God put me in the midst of a bunch of heathens. I mean, you, you could tell by the things they said and what they did. They, they, yeah, there you have it. I'll just leave it there. And I began to pray, God, bring me somebody into this warehouse that loves you like I love you, that I have somebody to have some fellowship with. And God opened a door and brought two. And it was the most amazing thing. We would pray together. We would have Bible studies together. We would bounce sermons off of each other. And God began to use that moment, that seven years, to build some character in my life. See, what I have found out now, that without that character that I was building in that seven years that I thought I was trapped was the character that I had to have to stand in a pulpit and preach a message to you guys. When I was in seven years in a, in a, can I call it a pit? When I was in seven years of a pit in my life, I had no clue that Family Worship Center, Center existed in my future, but God did. God knew, and what God was saying all along the way, I'm going to put the right people here, and when you build that character, I'm going to move you to this place, and when I move you to this place, I'm going to teach you 
some toughness in your heart because you're a big baby, Ronnie. So he put me in a situation that was an incredible ministry, but the hardest thing I've ever been in in my life, I was actually skinny and had hair when I started it. (laughs) I am not lying to you. That job absolutely stressed me out of my gourd, but God put me in a place, and God put me in a place where I had to learn to have some tough skin and some tenacity. And then when I got out of that, God put me in another situation. In that situation, he was teaching me longevity. He was saying, you need to learn from this pastor. This pastor knows how to go somewhere and stay, plant some roots, and do a job. And he put me in a place where I learned some longevity. And it was when I was learning some character, when I was learning some tenacity and some tough skin, he put me in a place where I learned how to just stick with it through thick and thin and just to roll with it, that God said, now that you have waited now that you have been patient and I didn't think I was very patient now that you have have done everything that I've asked you to do now I'm going to elevate you to the place of pastor I didn't get this overnight and now that I look at it thank you God that you didn't give it to me overnight because there is no way that I could have handled it I was telling Bernardo on the trip we eat an elephant one bite at a time. It is baby steps that we go through. Little steps at a time. It is baby steps. And what do we do with the baby steps? Every step we take towards God, every step that we take in the right direction, every step that we take, we're celebrating every moment of this journey. God, thank you. Thank you that you gave me an offering. God, thank you that you gave me some tools. God, thank you because in that, I feel the love of God. I feel the love of people. Because of that, I feel accepted. I rejoice in the midst of what you are doing, no matter how small it may seem. It is huge in my life, and I'm honoring you. I'm praising you. But other than that, I am waiting patiently because you have something in store for me. You might want to write this down. You may want to Facebook this. God may not be saying no to your prayers, no to your desires, and no to your dreams, but he may be saying not yet. The timing isn't right. Do I need to repeat that for anybody? Yeah? God may not be saying no to your prayers, no to your desires, And no to your dreams. But he may be saying, not yet. The time isn't right. Remember, God deals in timing when you and I deal in time. And God's timing is always perfect. I'm going to take you to Psalm, the book of Psalm. And and in Psalm, David writes something. And as David writes something, this is what we're going to look at for the next four weeks. And David writes something that I believe is really going to take us to a whole nother level of living where we're going to raise the bar, where there are no limits, that we begin to trust God and know that God is absolutely in control. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. And what I'm going to call this is I'm going to call this stepping up. Stepping up. It is the first step of what David teaches us And it is stepping up, stepping up. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. I'm going to read it, then we're going to come back and dissect it, okay? Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of the sinners uh, uh, that sinners take, nor sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree that is planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, but whose leaves does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. So let's go back and let's look at what it means to step up. Step up. What does it mean to step up? Well, David is telling us the first principle in this is this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. He does not walk in step with the wicked. So if he does not walk in step with the wicked, what does he do? He takes a step up into righteousness. That's good. You got that? Chris, 
I want you to stand on your chair. Yes, you can be tall for once. I'll be David, you be Goliath. Put all that down. Away from your feet. There you go. Pastor Chris, I want you to pick me up and bring me up to your level. Okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's not happen. okay, one more time. Nick's Fight Club. Come on. No. Oh. No? No. Watch your back. Listen to that. That was funny. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's, it's hard. It's not easy to do, is it? No. But it, see, this is what I know about friendships. It's hard for, for him to bring me up to that level. But when I get into a relationship, how easy is it for me to pull you down so to good. my level? So good. Come on. It is so easy when we Speak get that. into situations, yeah. when you get into circumstances, when we get into friendships, we always try to connect with people that are kind of like us. Well, they, you know, we go through these things, and we're always hoping that in these situations they can lift us up to their level, mm. which is usually a bunch of garbage. Yeah. Yeah. But what we find in this lifting up into this place what they generally do is they always pull us down into wickedness. Yeah. And what David is telling us is when you get into the council of friends, when you get into the council of people, don't get caught into something that can pull you down. But David so says it is time to take a step. Yeah. What is that? It is a step of faith. It is a step of action. It is a step of direction. It is a step that we say, God, I am trusting you. If you anoint me a king, and that is great. But if you send me back to the field, that is great also. It is in your timing, and I take a step in the right direction. We've got to quit walking in the wrong direction. With our attitude, with our friends, with, with situations. Because if we get in the wrong direction, situations it always pulls us down so what does David do he says this he steps it up basically he takes a step in the right direction and then it goes on to say or stand in the way that sinners take we'll talk about that next week or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law Day and night. It is consistent. God, you're mine. God, I'm yours. God, we're married. God, I'm in this thing for the long haul. And when that happens, here's the payoff. Number three, verse three. That person is like a tree planted. In other words, it's going to be stable. In other words, there's going to be stability in your life. In other words, in that stability, you're going to find blessing. What does it mean to be blessed? Ask Bernardo. What does it need to be blessed? It is the favor of God being poured out upon your life. What does it mean to be blessed? He goes on and says, it, it basically is this, you are going to be like a tree that is firmly planted and your root system is going to go deep, deep. So when circumstances come, boom! Ah, but my God's bigger. So good. When somebody steals my tools out of the back of my truck, boom! But my God is bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I'm anointed to be king, but I have to go back to the field and wait my time, boom! But my God is is bigger. Why? Because I have a root system that is being planted in the Word of God, being planted in my faith, being planted in trust, being planted in the love of God, and being planted in the house of God, and I am stable. That's good, mm, that's good stuff. Come on, Where am I planted? I am planted by streams of water. It's the living water of who Jesus Christ is. What does that mean when I'm planted by streams of living waters or I'm planted by the waters? It means this, that during those drought times, during those hard seasons, during those dry times, during those times where you have to question God, during those times that, that you're looking at it, you're going, it may feel like death up here, 
my leaves may have fallen off. It may be a little bit winter in my spiritual life right now, but I've got some roots that are going deep, and my roots are planted next to the Word of God, and there's some nutrition that's going inside of me. You may not see much growth right now, but you just wait because winter's going to be over with, and there's going to be a budding and a blooming that's going to take place in my life. You're planted at the right time. You are planted at the right place. You are planted in the right house. You are planted with the right people. You are planted with the right plan. You are planted with the right vision for such a time as this. And our root system is going to go down and it's going to be deep. Why? Well, it goes on and he goes on to tell us. Because this is what happens when your root system goes down and it's connected to a source that is bringing nutrition into your life, which yields fruit in its season. Which yields fruit in its season. Come on, somebody. You will yield fruit in your season. You might want to look at somebody and tell them, my miracle is in the making. My miracle is in the making. It is not my season right now, but my season is coming, and it is coming, and my miracle is in the making. Did you know that not every season of your life is going to be a fruitful season? See, that doesn't preach well, well, but I mean, you just got to tell the truth. Not every season is going to be a fruitful season. There's some seasons that you're going to look at, and you're going to look at that season and go, man, I feel a little dry. I feel a little dead in my spirit. I feel like there's nothing going on. Hey, God, where are you? In my prayer time. There are times, not every season is a fruitful season. Not every season is going to be a season that, that you feel like it is the best thing in the world. And there's a reason for that. There is a season for everything under the sun. The Word of God says there's a time to cry. And there is a time to praise. There's a time to weep and a time to sing. There's a time for life and there's a time for death. There's a season for all things. Just because you see no fruit does not mean that you're not blessed. That's good. Remember that. Just because you see no fruit does not mean that you are not blessed. God's blessing you so you can be a blessing. And God may be having to bless you little to get your attention. And when we learn to celebrate the little miracles of our life, God will begin to hand us bigger miracles and bigger miracles and bigger miracles so we can be a bigger blessing to people. It is all wrapped up in God's timing. But this is what I know about fruit. Fruit only grows in its season. It only grows in its season. It doesn't grow all the time. There are certain times it's called a process. There is a cycle of things that has to happen before that fruit becomes fruitful. What do you do? Well, let's go to planting and farming. That's what my dad did. Let's go to planting and farming. The first thing that we've got to do is we've got to learn to plow the ground. Why do we have to plow the ground? Plowing the ground is turning things over. If you're turning things over. Have you ever plowed? Have you ever had to turn some things over to find something new? It is a new start in your life. Has anybody ever had to plow? You were single. You plowed and then boom, you turned everything over and you're married. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. I did a lot of that plowing, and I did a lot of wrong sow seeing, so seed seed sowing. And then I began to plow this ground in the most incredible way. And in that plowing, that time of waiting, it's like where you kind of have to go, God. It's just it's yours. It's all you. It's all about you. And God says, "You've waited. You've been patient." Now I've got the perfect thing for you. It's turning over and trusting God. It's, it's where you begin to plant a seed and you trust God. But it's where all of a sudden God brings you a blessing and you begin to celebrate it. Anybody ever been given a blessing and you celebrated that blessing? Anybody? I'm going to celebrate this blessing right now because I did some plowing, I did some plowing, I did some plowing, and I was waiting patiently upon the Lord and I kept kind of sowing some wrong seeds in the wrong places yeah. and getting messed up with the wrong people. And God kept having to shut a door and say, uh-uh, uh-uh, that's not the plan I've got for your life. So I kept planting. And when I gave up and gave it to God, 
God dropped Shannon into my life. And when God dropped Shannon into my life, it birthed a song in me. Do you want me to sing to you today? <laughs> Anybody want me to sing? Yeah. You stepped out of my dreams and into my heart, and now you're my angel divine. You're beautiful. You're mm-hmm, and you're mine. I don't know. I didn't want to say your age in front of everybody. <laughs> but this is what I know. On this Valentine's Day, I want you to know that in all the waiting that I did, in all the plowing that I did, it was the waiting upon God that he blessed me with you. And I found favor with God in you. I found ministry with you. You, you had me at hello. You complete me. I'm, I'm trying to use all the cheesy lines from the movies. You complete me. But, babe, there's no way I could do this ministry without you. And if I'd have got ahead of God, I'd have never had you. And if I'd have never had you, I'd have never had this. Because you keep me straight here. You are the best thing that's ever happened to me. Happy Valentine's Day. So we plant. We plant. We turn everything over and then we plant. And what are we doing when we plant? We turn it over and we say, this is a new beginning, God. I've got a new thing going on. I've got something I need to do. And then we plant a seed. And what we do with that seed, we're saying, God, I don't see it because it's buried, but I put this seed into action. I don't see it. God, it's yours. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait on that seed. And God, through the word of God, he begins to water that through the word of God, I am planted by a stream. I am waiting patiently. I have planted something in faith. I do not see it any longer. But God begins to do something in that seed. God begins to do something in that ordinary situation. And that little seed underneath the ground, it begins to do something. It's laying there dormant. And all of a sudden, can I, can I use, just say the power of God begins to work in that seed? Because we're talking about faith. All of a sudden, that seed does something like this. Ooh, don't know what that was. Don't know. But something begins to sprout out of that seed. Ooh, <laughs> begins to prout out of that seed. And something incredible begins to take place. It begins to give life. It begins to grow. And if we keep that thing fertilized through the word of God, it will begin to produce fruit. Amen? Yeah. Simple but good. Isn't it? Simple but good. I'm going to end with this. Don't give up on your dream. Don't give up on your dream. Because where there is no sow, there is no grow in your life. Do not give up on your dream. Give God every part of your dream. Give God every part of who you are. Tell God, God, I may not be a patient person, but I will wait patiently upon you. You know what God needs? God, this is what God needs from you, Romans 12, 2. You might want to write this down if you don't know Romans 12, 2. But this is what God needs from you. God needs you to do a transformation in your mind. It is a new way of thinking. It is a new attitude. It is a new thought that you have. I'm going to encourage you to do that this week. Okay? This is what I want you to do. When a circumstance hits, this is what I want you to say. Ah, but my God is bigger. There's a transformation that's taking place in my mind. The Word of God says this. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. Don't become negative. Don't become a pessimist. Don't, don't be somebody that just gives in, throws in the towel and gives up. Don't be somebody that has a bad attitude about everything that happens. But the Word of God says, don't conform any longer to the patterns of this world because the patterns of this world are not my plan for your life. They're the plan of an enemy that comes to steal, kill, and to destroy every dream and every plan that he has for your life. But God goes on to say, but, don't you love the big butts of the Bible? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is where we put on 
basically the mind of Christ, where we begin to have the right attitude, where we have the right thinking, where we start concentrating on the thought that my God is bigger than that situation. My God is bigger than anything the enemy is going to throw at me. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper because my God will win. It is where we become transformed by the renewing of our minds. But I love what it says after that. Then, then, after you have waited patiently upon God, after you have got your mind in order, when you stop believing the, eye, the lies of an enemy that whispers stupidity in your ear and you believe it all the time, whenever we turn that ear off to the enemy and we turn our ear on to God and we're having a transformation that is taking place in our mind, he says, then, when you do that, there is a response to what we have to do if we're going to step up into this thing like what David says. Then you will be able to test. God tells us to put him to a test in this. Then you will be able to test and approve. Don't you like that? Test and approve what God's will is for your life. And it goes on to say, and it's his good, pleasing and perfect will. Anybody ready to step up? Anybody ready to step up and get out of what the devil wants to throw at us? Anybody ready to step up into the favor of God? Anybody ready to step up into the blessing of God? Anybody ready to step up into the mercies of God? Anybody ready to step up and have peace in our mind? Anybody ready to step up into a new love relationship? Anybody ready to step up? Are you ready to step up and receive the very best that God's got for you? Are you ready to step up into the favor of God? Are you ready to step up where the blessing falls on you and it is so much of a blessing that you can't contain it and it flows out of you to other people? Are you ready? Let's receive it in the name of Jesus. Father, today I receive your very best. Today in the name of Jesus, I claim victory over my enemy. Today, in the name of Jesus, I claim victory over situations and circumstances that seems less than what I deserve because I deserve the best in the name of Jesus. Jeremiah 29, 11 tells me that you have a plan for me and that plan is to prosper me, not to give me harm. That plan is to give me hope and a future. And in you, I receive that today in the name of Jesus. Today, what I'm doing is I'm stepping up I'm getting out of the counsel of the wicked and I'm taking a step in the right direction with my attitude, with my mind, with my heart, and with my walk. And I move forward in the name of Jesus. Hey, as every head is bowed, nobody's looking around before you leave. If you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and you're here today and the Holy Spirit is just tugging at your heart, we make it very simple for you because Jesus made it very simple for us. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to call you down. I'm not going to embarrass you. But we just want to give you a time to accept Jesus into your life. And if, and if I could pray with you before you leave, with nobody looking, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. And I want to pray a sinner's prayer with you before you leave. And it's as simple as that. Anybody I can pray with? We're all good here today, amen? Okay, I want to pray a prayer of blessing with you. And then I'm going to send you out on the public, all right? Father, we love you. And Father, we're so thankful that in you we find our hope, in you we find our peace, in you we find eternal life. And we say thank you for that. Thank you for the word of God that is so incredible, that it teaches us. I want to pray that this week that we can step up, that we can take that step of faith, that we can plant a seed and watch you water it. And I want to pray that as you begin to do a new work in people's lives this week, for favor, and blessing to fall upon us in the most incredible way. I pray that as we leave this place that you'll put a smile on our face, that you'll put a skip on our step, and we're going to be careful always to give you all the praise and the glory. As everyone says, amen.